Hello, everyone. Welcome to this webinar session. In these unprecedented times, it's nice to see so many of you joining this webinar. I hope you are all staying safe. And I will try my best to make this webinar as engaging, enriching, and also entertaining for you. And I hope you take some tips from this one and can use it. I welcome each and every one of you. Today we are focusing, focusing on storytelling and also story building strategies. How do we try to strengthen young children? When I talk about young children, I'm thinking in terms of a child in pre-K, kindergarten, first grade, in those uh, early elementary and early childhood settings. How do we use stories and story building strategies storytelling and story building strategies to improve, enhance their attention and self-regulation skills. The session that I'm presenting today will not only focus on that executive function uh, processes, but will also build in and weave in literacy building activities in order to build their attention in order to build their language. And another aspect feature of this would be how do we increase and enhance their social emotional capacities. So one of the most important things in storytelling, of course, is we are grabbing the children's attention. Storytelling is, of course, different from story reading because storytelling, we don't really have a book in our hand, but we have children imagine or draw a visual picture in their mind. So it helps to build their imagination and strengthen their concentration because they have to concentrate on that visual image in their mind. And each one of the children may build a slightly different image, but at the same time, they are bringing in their past knowledge on the subject or on what we are sharing with them. So we are also improving their memory ability. In addition to that, one of the things I will try to share is how to make some simple adaptation. I'm not going deep into details about using assistive technology, but simple adaptations that you can make so that all children or engage. All children have a role to play. And all children, children with uh, special needs and children with significant disabilities and children without any uh, special needs um, can actively engage and respond to the storytelling. I think I moved it back. Uh, next one is actually a poll, and let me explain a little bit about that poll before we actually go into the poll. I am talking about, when I'm talking about stories, I'm talking about storytelling. Okay, that's one thing that I wanted to mention. And story building is groups. In other words, you have the children taking turns to tell stories, and you initiate it, and the children join in. So that's how the poll works. Um, that's one of the polls. Um, this one is an initial poll, and I'm trying to find out who are the participants today. Do we have general education teacher, special education teacher, speech pathologist, and um, different kinds of support staff and administrators? Um, this is a time many of us are working from home, so maybe many parents have joined in too. Um, so I welcome each and every one of you. Uh, a lot of you are speech pathologists and, and special education teachers. And uh, that's nice to see that we have a segment from everybody represented here, uh, except not general education teachers. I hope you will share these ideas. Maybe they are busy teaching at this time online teaching because many districts have moved on to online. Welcome to you all. So to 
share a little bit about myself. I'm an author of multiple books, and uh, you will see many of these pictures of them. Uh, they focus on the areas of early childhood education, on legal compliance, st students with significant needs, children with uh, severe and multiple disabilities, early childhood transition, and a couple of things that I just came out this year, I don't have them on the screen, and that is, um, one is a mindfulness guide. It's a quick reference guide available from Education 311. And the other one is a book for parents from birth to three, nurturing the growing mind, gr growing brain, body, and behaviors. So I'm an educational consultant, and I present at major international conferences. So let's examine the storytelling benefits. As I say, shared with you just a few couple of minutes ago, storytelling is different from story reading. So in other words, what you are doing is either from your own background, ethnic background, or your traditional stories, or you take any picture books uh, and you share that story with the children and you are not reading, you do not have the book in front of you, you get the children to imagine all of the things that's happening in the story. This helps to build their critical thinking, their social skills, and you can foster their attention and self-regulation. Because what happens is when you are telling the story, you are grabbing their attention. And when you engage them with changing your voice and showing kind of emotions through your voice, you, you're building their imagination even further. They have to imagine that. And it's a way you can even include the children during the storytelling as part of the story. And one of the most important things that happens is literature, any, any storytelling that you use, it helps children to see things from different perspectives. And this is what research has proved. It helps children develop empathy. Immediately what comes to mind, those of you who are in the early childhood arena, the story of um, Alexander and the Wind-Up Mouse uh, by Leo Leone. And then this kind of interaction between the real mouse and the toy mouse, and the empathy that the real mouse feels for the toy mouse, and that kind of relationship, that builds a certain image in the child's mind. I mean, you can do that even with the story reading, but it is even more you can express it when you are telling the story and using your emotions to convey that. And Research tells us that heightened levels of sympathy may lead to more pro-social behaviors. So most of you, I presume, are familiar with this famous story, Are You My Mother? And in this story, there is the mother bird, and she's sitting on her egg, and then the egg jumps, and then the mother bird says, Oh, oh it's time for me to go get some food for my baby. And so she flies away, and then the little baby bird comes out of the egg, and then he goes searching everywhere for his mother. So you can use the story. I just put that picture there. You don't even have to. But if you need for some students, in order to give them the cue, you can have just one little picture of the mother bird and the baby bird there. And... Um, so, you know, you can begin the story with a kind of lot of checking their prior knowledge even before you start telling the story. You can ask them about have they seen nest? How, where would they find the nest? You know, have they seen a nest would be a simple yes or no question. But where would they have seen? That could draw a variety of answers. So you can also tailor your questions in a, such a way that you have provide opportunity for every student. Some may be able to answer yes or no questions, some more complex questions. And then this is a story where he, the baby bird goes on searching everywhere and he asks all the animals that he comes across. And then you can have children during the story 
Oh, he goes to a dog. And do you want to be a dog? Do you want to make the sound the dog makes? Or do you want to be a cat? And do you want to make the sound the cat makes? And you can also incorporate that. You may not do that the first time you are doing that, telling the story. But certainly the second time. And one of the things I do believe in is you don't have to pick a different story each day. You can take the same story and you can have embed within that story multiple activities. You can include role play. You can include a little bit of acting and drama into that. You can include a, a kind of graphic organizers. I'm going to share all of that with you. And you can use a variety of questioning strategies. And you can actually get up and walk around and tell the story, and the children are playing different roles. So you can do that, and then if you need, you can also provide the second time. First time, you just tell the story and make it short, make it very highly engaging and entertaining and enriching for the children. And then you can add the next time, if you need, certain picture cards so that some children, when you are saying, oh, the little baby bird went asking the hen, are you my mother? And then that child holds up his hen card or something like that. You can give them that way for a child who does not respond uh, using words. You can give that option too. Um, the most important thing is you are building your students' imagination and you are building their attention skills. And it is not important for you to memorize the story. You don't have to go verbatim every single thing that's mentioned in the story. You can summarize it, and you can make it shorter. You can use different words, and that way you are also enhancing children's vocabulary each time you tell the story. So as I mentioned earlier, this is a uh, poll. And in this poll, you are going to let me know whether you use storytelling usually, you are building stories as a group, you are you including puppets, and you are using personalized adapted tools, visual tools or assistive technology or some other tools in order to en engage and enable participation. Okay. So many of you do use storytelling. That's fantastic because then you are definitely promoting children's imagination um, and their attention skills. And many of you, I think one of the things as I'm going to share with you, the group storytelling activity, um, I, I see that uh, some of you are not currently using it, hopefully uh, most of you will start using it. And since the polls are still going on, and since we have a pretty large audience, uh, I'll give it one more second. I think we are almost done. And um, we're still coming in. OK. Um, so a lot of you are using storytelling. That's fantastic. And I'm going to be sharing several uh, stories today. And one of them, I will actually try to tell the story to kind of demonstrate how do you um, use a lot of emotion and, uh, and make it engaging. And a lot of you, you're using also uh, assistive technology devices. That's fantastic. Uh, personalized adapted tools. And that is critical to include every child's participation, access, engagement, and an opportunity to respond using the UDL principles. So let's say I have already shared the story of Are You My Mother? And the second time I'm sharing that story, and immediately following sharing that story, I could make a graphic organizer like this. So that even though we may be using one story, there are multiple ways to grab their attention, the children's attention, and then build their memory. And not only that, this helps them to build 
kind of thinking skills, which is also critical, the cognitive skills. So, okay, so you can ask a question. Baby bird is searching for his mother. What do you think? Do you think the cat is his mother? And you will say some children answering yes or no, and most probably they will say no. And then why not? Why is the cat not the baby bird's mother? And you can go around like this with the dog and the boat. And could the boat be a baby bird's mother? Oh, why not? And then, so in other words, make it interactive as much as possible. The other thing that I have shown here is as a follow-up activity, you could also have the children make their own little headbands, or you could have the, the faces done maybe, and then they attach the or glue the headband so that they can wear the headbands. And there could be many cats, and there could be many dogs, and there could be many hens, and you can do that with boats and uh, uh, cars and planes too. And then there is the one mother bird, and then the one, the one baby bird. The mother bird, all she needs is a little scarf. And so you can make it as a headband, and then they can put, put it on, and then you could do a little play using that. When you do that, you, you, you know, this is one of the things I want to emphasize, especially in the early childhood classroom and in the first grade kindergarten classroom. One of the things you want to do is to build that love for learning, and this is one way. He, this is connected to the story. This is building their knowledge. They now will know, every one of them will know what kind of a sound a cat makes or a dog makes and a hen makes and why they cannot be the uh, baby bird's mother. And they can act out the story, and that builds their language. And this becomes engaging, enriching, and at the same time, entertaining. Sometimes we shy away from the word entertaining, thinking somehow we are wasting time when we are having fun. But fun is what sends that dopamine, uh, uh, tries to inc you know, increases the dopamine level, the happy hormone, and that's what we want children to be in that happy mode when they are learning. So the other thing that you can do uh, in during story time is to embed novelty items. You can even make that kind of a tree and make as a group project or several students working together, or they can make it individually. All that is is the inside of the paper towel roll, and then with felt wrapped around it, you have a little tree, and that's where the nest is usually. I mean, that's a question you can ask. And then you can use puppets, and then you can use, even if you don't have time, you can just attach pictures of the animals on a craft stick, and they can carry that with them. So these are all things that the kids themselves can do. All they have to do is to glue that craft stick onto the back of the picture, or they can draw their own picture, and we should allow that creativity to grow too. Um, when you are telling the story, make it interactive. And as I said, Encourage active participation as the stories. Be animated, be energetic, and try to follow up with playful activities that are short to match the different needs that you would have, diverse needs in your classroom and the interest levels. And when you find that the children are losing interest, you know, you, that's the time you move on to the next activity. Sometimes we always think it has, the story has to finish. No. We have to be watchful because children, young children, four to six years of age, have difficulty sitting still for long periods of time. The ideal time is about 20 minutes. So when you're picking stories to tell and stories to read as well, make sure it has predictable language. Make sure it has rhymes and repetitive sounds. When you use repet repeated refrains, what it happens is children get excited and they like to join in the choral reading and the choral uh, uh, group participation. And if we are not doing choral reading here, but choral response. So, and each time you are repeating the story, uh, get them to kind of make a prediction. So 
you know, you have already shared the story of are you my mother. The next time, oh, next, what do you think is going to happen next? Or which animal or which one is this baby girl going to meet? Do you remember from the last time I told you the story? So you are asking them, working on their working memory. So the other tool that you can use, this is a story map organizer tool. You are trying to teach the various aspects, the story elements, with the story map organizer tool. So then they get a broader picture of that story. And you can do that with story reading, but you can certainly do it with storytelling, because then they have to draw everything from their memory. So you are increasing their opportunity to jog their memory and bring it back from their past knowledge. Okay? Because they have already read the story, they, you have already shared the story, and they have to remember that and then respond to this. So besides the story title and the author of the story, who are the story characters? Who else was in the story? Where did the story take place? Was it just in the tree? Or was it near a building site? Or was it all the way in the woods? Because the baby bird goes all over searching for his mother. So it does go into various places, and you are building the children's vocabulary. And then you may have um, asking, you may ask questions about something that happened in the story. Oh, he meets the little uh, um, cat. Or he may, he's, you know, he meets a plane. He looks up and he sees a plane. Do you think that could be the mother? You know, different things that happen in the story. And then most importantly, what happened in the story at the end when he meets his mother. And then you can also combine it with some questions for them. What would you do if you went to the store and then you walked away a little bit and then you can't find your mother? Do you get scared? What do you do? What are some things? So you are preparing them also for certain eventuality. What, what happens? You are going into the mall and then you decide to go and look somewhere and you can't find your mother and you get worried? What can, what can you do? And so that's kind of problem-solving activities also you can embed. And then um, I'm, I'm looking at some questions, and uh, I could answer it at the end. Um, and I will answer each one of those questions. But let me answer these two couple of things that, uh, that has been raised. One of the things that has been raised is, what do you mean by personalized adaptive tools? What do I mean by personalized adaptive tools? One is, of course, we all know is assistive technology that a child may use. But I am also talking about, and I'm going to share with you a couple of them later on in a slide. One of them may be uh, an index card with a yes or no response. Okay, uh, The index card will have the word yes or no with a face showing yes and a face showing kind of no, and it will be attached to a craft stick. That's kind of one example of an adaptive tool. Another adaptive tool is, let's say the child wants to hold a puppet, and the child has difficulty holding the puppet because he has difficulty grasping the puppet. Uh, the option is to attach that puppet with Velcro to a Velcroed glove. And I will show you that example too. These are kind of a couple of examples that you would have as a personalized adapted tools um, instead of somebody else doing it. And did the POPs work with all children from two to eight, or it, can it use with bigger than eight years old? To be quite honest, many of these props, like the puppet, can even work with older students. We may not use it because we think somehow it is something for, meant for younger kids. But we can have, especially when you're in second grade or third grade or even higher up, what you can have is you can have these puppets and have the students tell the story instead of the teacher telling the story. And um, so that's an opportunity. They use the puppet to tell the story 
what it is they are demonstrating their language skills and they are also working to use their working memory because they have to remember to tell the whole story. So you can have that option available. And you can use a variety of tools and variety of props, and the students themselves can make the puppets and can make the, these, these props. Now, going back to this slideshow uh, and the presentation, how do you use stories to teach problem solving? Most of you will be familiar with the Cats for Sale story. Um, this is a beautiful story about, really, I think it teaches problem solving, and it also teaches indirectly impulse control. How do you teach self-regulation impulse control? Um, that's kind of the lesson that you draw from the story. This cap seller is selling caps, and that particular day he cannot sell any caps, so he's kind of tired and maybe disappointed because he has not earned any money, and so he's tired. He cannot even buy any food that day. He's tired and hungry as well. So that can bring empathy for that cap seller in many of your students. So he decides to go and rest under a tree, and then he, this cap seller has an interesting way of selling his caps. He has them on his head, and he has it in a certain order, and you can have the children repeat that over and over again, brown caps and blue caps and checked cap. That's the one he wears on his head. And then you have them uh, like a pattern. You can have them repeat that during the story after you have shared it first time. And then the cap seller, after his nap, checks his cap, and he finds that all his caps are gone except for the checked caps. And then he gets really upset because he looks up and he finds that the monkeys on the tree have taken all his caps, and he is pounding and showing his fist, and he, none of that work because he's angry and he's not showing any self-regulation at that point. But when he does one thing, which turns out to be a pretty smart thing to do, he kind of actually he does it in anger. He throws his cap down, and then immediately all the caps come down. So you could use this story. Before you come to that ending, you can stop the story and say, what do you think the cap seller, the peddler, what can he do? His caps are gone. They're all on the monkey's heads. How is he going to get it back? How is he going to get them all back? And he's upset. He is frustrated. And you can use different words so that you are, each time you're telling the story, you are using different words to convey the kind of similar meaning, and you are enhancing your student's vocabulary. That is another benefit of storytelling whereas story, compared to story reading. So you can give them options, like ask the monkeys nicely. Do you think they will give the caps back? Or just he should just give up and walk away. He's not going to get the caps back. And some children may say yes. Or maybe he should give the monkeys some banana. They will eat the banana, and then they will drop the caps. And then you can encourage children to come up with their own solution. This way, you are helping them to think of problem solving. And we talked earlier about personalized adaptation. One of the options would be a snow card for some of them when you ask a question, or they choose between giving banana or asking please in one card will say, say please, uh, give me back my caps. Another one will say, give monkeys banana, and they make a choice. That is a personalized adaptation choosing between two choices, options that are already thought of and presented to the child. So you use stories to promote um, problem solving, role play, and then you can also use puppets. And you can combine it with naturally occurring events. And um, especially children with special needs, many of them may be experiencing language delays and they may have difficulty uh, 
understanding instructions, and they may have difficulty, definitely more difficulty, in responding to questions. So we have to provide those personalized adaptations so that they have an opportunity to respond, and that will also provide them a way to increase their language. And one suggestion that's coming up in this, older students can also use digital tools to record themselves working with props during storytelling. That is an excellent idea, yes. They certainly can use digital tools, and today that is so easily available. Yes, most certainly. And here is an opportunity for me to share a story with you. This story is called The Monkey and the Crocodile. It's an ancient Indian fable. And the story is from a series of stories. A number of stories are available under the title, under the broad heading, Panchatantra Story. What does Panchatantra mean? It really literally translated, it may mean five tricks, but these are all problem-solving Stories. In other words, each one has kind of a problem and how the problem is solved. So this is a story, as I said, from India. And one of the things that I would um, strongly recommend is to have as many stories as possible from diverse cultures, different ethnicities, so that and you know invite families to share stories with you. They can either send you a book that you can read and kind of, you know, share that story with your students. Or occasionally you can invite parents to come and tell a story. So these are all different ways you are enriching the diversity that we see in each of our classrooms and to respect that diversity. So this is a story about a monkey and a crocodile. A monkey lived on a fruit tree by the bank of a river. And this tree was on that bank, and there was a big river next to it. And this monkey lived on this fruit tree, and the fruit tree is called jamun tree. Jamun is a kind of a blackberry, except it looks different. And I would say it's maybe a little sweeter than the blackberry. And so the monkey had a very happy life. He would jump from branch to branch every day and eat the fruits, and then he will sleep and take a nap, and he had a wonderful time. Then one day, a crocodile swam by, and then the crocodile decided to rest on the bank of the river under the tree. And then the monkey saw the crocodile and said, Oh, you are my guest. You have come, this tree has been my home for many years, and you have come under my tree. Welcome, my guest. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to throw you some jamun, the blackberries, and have them, eat them, enjoy them. And the crocodile tasted the blackberry and absolutely loved it. And then the monkey threw some more, and this went on for many days. One day, the crocodile said, you know what, do you want to throw some more Jamun to me, I want to take them for my wife. And so the crocodile took the, and the monkey threw the berries, and the crocodile took them home to his wife. And the wife ate the blackberries or the jamun and said, Oh, these blackberries, these jamun, they are so sweet. If the monkey is eating these berries daily, how tasty that monkey's heart must be. Oh, it must be wonderfully, wonderfully tasty. Please go get that monkey's heart. The wife tells her husband, the crocodile, to go get the monkey's heart. And the crocodile, the male crocodile, is taken aback. No, I can't do that. That would be cheating. That would be deceiving. He has been my friend. I can't do that. Oh, then I'm not going to eat. I'm not going to eat anything. If you won't get me the jamun, I'm not going to eat anything. I'm just going to starve. And then the male crocodile, the husband, didn't know what to do. He said, okay, 
I don't want you to starve. I'll go ask the monkey. And so in the meanwhile, the crocodile comes up with a plan. He is reluctant, but he has no choice. So he decides he will go and try to trick the monkey. So he goes to the monkey and says, Monkey, you know what? My wife loved those jamuns, the blackberries, so much. Oh, she wants to invite you for dinner to my house. Please come. And the monkey says, How can I come? I don't know how to swim. No, no, don't worry about that. You can just jump on my back and I'll take you to my home and my wife will be so pleased to see you. And the monkey jumped on the back and the crocodile uh, started swimming and then he went deeper and deeper into the water and the monkey was getting scared and I said, oh, no, no, what are you doing? What are you doing? You're going deep into the water. I'm getting scared. And then the crocodile decided to reveal his plan. Oh, now there was no need for me to hide my plan, he thought. I'm going to tell him, I'm going to tell the monkey what I'm going to do. So he tells the monkey, you know what? I'm taking you home so that I'm going to go deeper into the water and then I'm going to take your heart. I'm going to have to kill you for that. And I'm going to take the heart to my wife. And then when the monkey heard this, he was astounded. He was kind of shocked. But, you know, the monkey did not panic. He stopped for a second and immediately he came up with a very quick, smart plan. Oh, crocodile, why didn't you tell me before? It would have been a privilege and an honor for me to be your, to give my heart to your wife for her to have it for her dinner. But, you know, there is a problem. We have to go back to the tree. My heart is in the hollow of the tree. I left it there. Oh, let's go back quickly so that I can give you the heart and you can take it to your wife and I can bring it with me and I will also come along. And the crocodile said, okay, let's rush. Let's go back, get back to the tree. And then they both swam. And as soon as they reached the bank of the river and near the tree, the monkey jumped off and he could quickly climb the tree and he got on to the topmost branch and did not come down. And then the crocodile said, what's up there? What's going on? Why are you delayed? And then the monkey said, I am so shocked. You tried to deceive me and you wanted my heart when we have been such good friends. And how foolish of you to think we can take our heart out and leave it on a tree. How can we be alive without our heart? And then the crocodile felt ashamed and he swam away. And so the lesson that we learn is when you think and when you problem solve, you can win difficult situations. That's the story. And one thing I would like to share with you, this story is available on YouTube. These are books available, and then these stories are available just online without the, the need for a video. And based on what you remember from this story, go back and please do check the story, see, and then each one of you is going to come up possibly with a slightly different version of what you remember compared to maybe what you read. So that is one thing that happens with storytelling. And moving on is the next activity that I was talking about, which is group story building activity. Again, this is to help foster the executive function processes, the working memory, the cognitive flexibility, and also impulse control and self-regulation. What do you do? How do you involve children in story building activities? The, what are the sequence of the story? 
this teacher maybe you know starts the story and it may be something as simple as the other day i went to the zoo and then i saw a lion this is with the younger children you may begin as simple as that i saw a lion and then the lion was roaring and that scared me and i thought the lion was roaring so loudly and i began to think is he hungry is he going to pounce on me and then you can leave it at that point and then give it to a child you know maybe a child who is usually more eager to initiate and then give each child an opportunity to add something to the story and you can take stories that you have shared with them already like cats for sale or the lion and the mouse or uh, you know the carrot seed any of those stories that you have already shared with them and you can start that as the story starter and then they can add bits to it in the beginning you will find that they are only adding one word or a simple statement and maybe it is just a sequence of events but uh, gradually these stories will become complex you are helping to build their language but in addition to that they have to children have to pay careful attention to each other as the story evolves and when you do that they are learning to take turns they are learning to pay attention they are also thinking of what they are going to say so they are trying to make connections with what the other person said so this is also another way to build that group group working together and respecting each other and taking turns and then the another option that you can do uh with this kind of story building activity is uh you can the teach as the children or you know you have started the story and you can have it written down already before you uh, start and then you can share it orally and then as the children are sharing their stories as the story is evolving you can write them down either on the easel board or on newsprint that you put on the wall or if it, you are a parent and you are sharing a story you can just take a piece of paper and write the story down for them and then you get the children during maybe center activity or some other time to add pictures to that story and then that could be the story that you read the next day or later in the day uh during end of uh, school, school day closing at that time you can read that story so that they can compliment them on the story that they have built so another uh, benefit of course is all the ef skills but this is also building their imagination and their creativity so as i said you know in the beginning it's just a series of events but the complexity of the story will grow as the students practice it over and over again and they are also manipulating the information that somebody else has said and then they are adding to that so they are manipulating that information of what they have heard and they are adding information so this uh, kind of strengthens their working memory a uh, support that you can add uh, you can add it at any time but particularly when you are doing this group building is an extraordinarily wonderful idea uh, that uh, galinsky has mentioned in her book and that is in order to support the group those students who are all in the listening mode they have a ear picture and if you don't want to make a ear picture but it's just a ear picture with an index uh, sorry craft stick attached to it and you are just putting the ear picture on a little index card and it is attached to a craft stick so they hold that when they hold that that means they are in the listening mode instead you could also just attach it to your easel or somewhere to your pocket chart and that is what everybody has to, you point to it and they have to remember that it is their turn uh, to listen but the person who is telling the story has a mouthpiece 
and that person passes it on to the next person sitting next to them uh, in the group so that that person then takes over the mouthpiece and adds another aspect to the story. So, so this way they will not be interrupting each other. And you can also point to the earpiece from time to time if you have children just wanting to interrupt or uh, they want to say something else uh, or they want to add something when it is not their turn. So this is, teaches them inhibitory control. This one teaches them cognitive flexibility, that is they have to take turns and they have to wait for their turn. And they also have to use that additional tool to help them remember when it is their turn to talk and when it is their turn to listen. So what are some examples? Um, you know, you can take that caps for sale story, for example, and slightly modify it and say, once upon a time there was a peddler, he sold caps. And uh, instead of caps, you say he sold apples and oranges. And one day he sold all of his apples and oranges, and he had a lot of money. I haven't added that. He had a lot of money, and he was tired, so he decided, I'm going to go for my lunch later, and he decided to rest under the tree. So you can start with that and then leave it to your students' imagination, and this would be particularly good, let's say, at the first grade level. It will be particularly good for students to come up with different ways, you know, the, uh, maybe it is not monkeys, but maybe some other animals that come next to him, or maybe somebody else sees something uh, about the man lying on the thing, and they think, oh, oh, this poor man, and so leaves him some food for him to eat, or somebody leaves him some water to drink. You know, they can come up with different ideas, and they can build that story and add little bits. Or they can say, you know what, there are monkeys staying there on the top of the tree. So you can do a variety of ways to build that story. And then I shared already about the one day I went to the zoo. And then for younger children, you can make a story like my friend came to play with me and we were playing outside and then we got a little tired. So we came inside and we built this with the blocks and then we built a tall tower and then something about when they built the tall tower, what happened and how did they build the tall tower or something like that they can come up with to add on. And, you know, you can, I have another example there about a, caterpillar uh, and how it fascinated and all that. Um, so the other thing that you can do is to strengthen emotional literacy, the impulse control, through storytelling and story building strategy. For example, many of you in early childhood and kindergarten classrooms may be familiar with the story of the grouchy ladybug. And you can take a situation from there and uh, you know, there is the happy goldie, uh, grou ladybug, sorry, happy go uh, la ladybug being happy. And when he sees this grouchy ladybug, does he feel sad? And is the grouchy ladybug angry? And does the nice ladybug get scared by that? You know, those kind of things. And then there is this wonderful, absolutely phenomenal illustrations to the story. It's called When Rosie Gets Really, Really Angry by Molly Bang. And you can certainly use puppets with that, and you can role play the activities. And you can also practice calming and mindfulness with this particular story. That's a beautiful story with extraordinary illustration about a little girl um, who initially does not want to share her toys with her younger sister, and then she goes for a walk to calm down. And um, I do see a lot of questions there. I am planning to answer all of those questions. Let me finish this, and then I will answer them at the end, each one of them. So use stories that are repetitive and use stories that are simple language, especially if you're working with many, many students in your classroom who have language difficulties. Um, you know, we often do not give children who have attentional difficulties a role to play. Often we ask those children who are sitting still and we compliment them. How about giving a role to play 
even before the story starts. You are going to be holding this puppet, or you are going to be my helper. You are going to, when I say, ask you to do something like the dog barking or the cat meowing, you are going to do that. So if you give that student a role to play, and then maybe you have two or three students and they, you give them turn to play, turn to role play, you are avoiding a problem before it starts. That is a personalized adaptation. So have different ways to respond to the story, verbally pointing, objects. And some students can use touch cues to get, you know, uh, you, you use touch cues. You, you provide cues for them to respond. Um, as I said, hold a quiet prop. And also another important thing is they have to gradually build this attention skills. So in the beginning, they may be able to sit just for five minutes, and then they may need a two-minute break, and then they may come back and join the story. And the story may be no more than 10 minutes when you're storytelling. And so it is important to allow that, and that's a personalized adaptation. So another beautiful story is the story of Carrot Seed, and it is a I, I just love this story because within a very small little story, picture book, you are really teaching so many things about pursuing something with a goal in mind. And also you are teaching about impulse control, that the little boy who finds the seed and plants the seed, despite all of the other people saying that it will not grow, he pursues perseverance. Resilience you are teaching. You are also teaching them that this is something that they can do themselves. They can plant a seed. So this is a great book that you can usually, actually use it as a prompt for a writing activity in a first grade classroom. Or if you're doing writing in kindergarten, you can begin that because most first graders should be able to easily read this book themselves. And then they can use that as a prompt to build that into a, uh, into a story about something they did to pursue something or about the story itself. They are writing the story, and that's a way you can use these, some, these kind of simple stories with just a few pages into a story prompt and then they will narrate the, the story in their own words, and they can draw the pictures and illustrate it, and you can make it into a little book for them with just stapling, say, let's say, six pages folded in half together. So, and so use that as a writing prompt. And they can also do like a family portrait, and they can make their own story about their family. That I'm sure many classrooms already do it. Um, you know, in the beginning, you may have just a couple of pages. One will have maybe one picture, and they will make one sentence because it's at the beginning. They are not used to writing. And then say there was a little boy, and then the next one maybe he planted a carrot seed, and the next one with the carrot seed grew into a big plant. It may be as simple as that, but they can draw the pictures, and they can write a sentence, but using this story as a prompt. And for children, younger children, you can use that same story in a variety of ways. You can use it to integrate different senses, like visual and auditory sense, and uh, looking at the book, having a word wall with simple words associated with the story, tactile sense, touching a seed, touching a carrot, touching soil, and visual, tactile, and kinesthetic oral kind of combined together and holding and touching a carrot and then making a book um, and smelling and tasting a carrot, which is healthy. And then, of course, one of my favorites always is using drama and role play. And you can also connect STEM with it, growing things. And you can also build uh, kind of a social-emotional type of chart, like the one I shared, about different situations that the child goes through, the young boy goes through as he is planting when different people are saying things. So different ways. 
And someone asked earlier about some of the tools, and these are all tools like the SNO cards and an object that is attached to the glove, Velcro, and you can attach a puppet, you can attach index cards um, that is uh, you know, uh, glued on with a craft stick, and then it has yes or no on it. It may have the story character picture on it. So, and then you have um, um, Super Talker there, and uh, you know, variety of tools, simple options for them to use. And um, the other important thing is, in any classroom, I am assuming in the early childhood and first grade classroom, we do have inclusive classrooms, and you can use peers with higher level of language with, with students who have communication difficulties. So they can provide them the pictures or they can provide, draw something, and the student with, uh, with communication difficulties gets to put it on the board or they make a selection from two options or um, the peers make the selection, uh, make the suggestions and the target child, the child with uh, communication difficulties or ch child who has um, difficulty physical needs touches a picture or holds a picture or grasps a picture making a selection from two. So the peers can be helping partners, and uh, so compliment them when they do that so that they engage socially as well. Uh, recognize both the peer helpers and the children who are using peers' help for their participation. So what are some invisible supports? When you begin, uh, let's say, a favorite activity, before that is storytelling or story building. Before that, you can increase their motivation level through, you know, especially in an early childhood classroom, you can blow bubbles so that it is something fun. Or they, you know, you squirt some lotion and they feel it and they can smell it. So something, or they hold a puppet. So you are giving children a turn to enjoy something and put them in a positive mood. And then um, those children who are a little reluctant to join the group or sit in the circle, this would be like a motivating invitation to them. And also when you are seating them, make sure you are seating the child who has attentional difficulty next to somebody who pays attention, who is drawn to stories, who is actively engaged. And also during the story, the student with attentional difficulties may be the one who is uh, holding something, who is your helper. And uh, let I have here an example, let's say a five-year-old five kindergartner, and this child has both strengths and needs, and uh, he does have uh, some special needs. He is in an inclusive setting, and he speaks in one or two word sentences, and this would be just as applicable to a girl, um, a child. Um, and this child happens to have frequent tantrums, and he has difficulty following adult directions. And he, especially during transition times, he wanders. So let's say this is circle time. What are some things that you can do? You can use pictures aided with text to participate in the storytelling activity. That's just for him, not for everybody. Participates with, you know, or you can use cues and prompts you provide. That will help him to engage and respond. And then he has a carpet square that he brings to the circle with his name on it and maybe even a picture on the back of the carpet square. And he follows a peer, brings him to the circle, and he next to, sits next to him in the circle time. These are all things that you can take as preventive measures from attention problem before. And then I have listed several things like small group, storytelling, taking turns with his peers. He practices. Um, he has his own tray. He for, works for five minutes and maybe takes a little break and then comes back and joins. Again, transition from circle may 
may be an issue at that time, you can use picture schedule. Of course, most of you use that. And make the final activity a fun favorite activity, use of a timer. And then um, one of the things you can use for uh, transition is music. And next time when I do the presentation, I'll share you with you how you can use music to for uh, help with the transition, especially for those who have those difficulties. And then, of course, sometimes you may have to prompt with physical assistance. And um, I have a list of storybooks here. These are absolutely fantastic. Each one has a certain kind of a theme as well as it will do something helpful to the kids. Carrot seed that I already mentioned, focus on self-control, working with a goal in mind. And are you my mother? I mentioned that. Alexander and the wind-up mouse, the grouchy ladybug, the caps for sale. I have listed all of the things that are presented through these stories, some of the benefits. And one of the story, the monkey and the crocodile, that I already shared with you. A couple of things that I didn't mention is Horton Hears a Who. Uh, that is a beautiful story taking on challenges. And also similar to uh, the carrot seed, it's pursuing a goal. So that's another thing that may be slightly older, maybe kindergarten, first grade. Wilma Unlimited, how Wilma... Rudolph becomes the world's fastest woman. Um, that's another beautiful story about focus and self-control. So do use these stories to help with both storytelling and story building. And some of the resources that I have listed. And thank you each and every one of you for joining this webinar. And I am planning to answer all of the questions. And the next webinar will be on April 8th. And the focus will be on how to use games and role play, drama, music, movement activities in order to build the brain, in order to build the executive function, in order to build attention, in order to make learning engaging, enriching, and entertaining. So that I would children will learn and benefit from instruction and will remember it because it was such a fun lesson. Now I'm going to uh, move on to the uh, questions. Any tips, advice for those of us who are not very good at telling stories in a com compelling way? Okay, that's an interesting question. All of us are gifted in many ways. And the first time, we may not come out that great, but as you practice, as you share stories, and children are not going to make a decision on how good you are. They are going to make, focus their attention on your story. So just practice it a couple of times if necessary, and then share, and then you will find you will improve. And then practice, if you have children, practice it with your own children. And listen to yourself, maybe videotape it. So another question is, how can we use puppet theater and storyboards with situations with excessive overactivity? That is, that is a good question, very good question. How can we use puppet theater? You know, maybe that is something you'd use during your center activity. You can have that as one of the activities. And... Um, you certainly don't want to make it over activity. That could be one of the choices during centers, and some of the children may engage with that. So that's one way. I am moving on to the next question. How do I build the imagination for them? There is, is there a special technique? There is really not a special technique. But when you tell them, let's say we are telling the story of caps for sale. So you're saying this Peddler is going along, caps for sale, caps for sale, 50 cents a cap, and who wants blue caps, who wants red caps? When you're saying that, what you are doing, you are letting your child, letting the children imagine somebody walking down the street. He has caps on his head. He has different colored caps. All this is bringing to their imagination. It may be difficult for some students who have 
language understanding difficulties, for them, you may want to use some visual prompts. But as they get you know, into the stories, they will also be listening to the words, and they will be grasping more and more information. How can I make assessment for my telling the story if it's really like it, if they really like it? Um, one of the best ways that you can uh, assess is see how engaged your students are, if they are paying attention, if they are playing with something else, or if they are falling on the floor, or if they are trying to touch somebody else, or if they look like they are totally distracted, that's when you stop. But then you also give those students a role to play. That is when you move on, you start the story a little bit, and then you engage them. Who wants to be the hen? Who wants to be a cat? So you have some cats and some hens and some dogs, and you intersperse that with, uh, you know, in the middle of your story, and they act out that story, part of that story that the baby, baby bird meets. The baby bird meets the hen, meets, but there are several hens because you have a number of students. So you do that as a, like a break within the storytelling to re-engage their attention. Uh, I would like to share you, the UAE, we don't use special needs anymore. We say people of determination. Yes, that's a beautiful word. As a matter of fact, in different countries, they use different words. And in some countries, they say people with different abilities, and that's also another good word. That's, I think in India that's what they use, and people of determination, yes. And each one of us have to be a person of determination so that we engage all of our children to move forward and gain the skills. How can story maps be taught to adults with language issues? Would it be more directive versus modeling? I suppose so, um, though I have used these kind of things in my presentations, but not as story maps, but more as graphic organizers. So you can use them as graphic organizers and then that and attach, if they are adults with significant difficulties, you can attach some object or you can attach some pictures. That way you build their memory. Oh, somebody has made a recommendation. I like Eric Call's Do You Want to Be My Friend? I'm sure I love all of Eric Call's books. And some of them will fit as a story. Some of them are more for sharing as a story reading activity. But you can certainly use some of them for uh, story building as a group activity. Many of, for example, brown bear, brown bear. You can make up other animals using that as the story prompt for a story building activity. Thank you very much, and we are beyond our time. Thank you for staying with me, and I'm extremely thankful to AbleNet for giving me this opportunity to share this session with you. Thank you. Stay safe, and uh, all the best.